சார் ஒரு ஃபைவ் மினிட்ஸ் ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணிடலாம் சார் இன்னொரு வெங்கடேஷ் சார் நம்ம யூனிட் ஒன்று கம்ப்ளீட் பண்ணியாச்சுங்க சார் நமக்கு யூனிட் டூ இப்போ நமக்கு போய்கிட்டு இருக்குங்க சார் யூனிட் டூ வந்து சாலிட் மெக்கானிக்ஸ் ப்ராப்ளம்ஸ் நான் ஒன் டைம் சொல்லி ஹேண்டில் பண்ணுறேன் அதானே ஓகே தான் ஆ ஆமாங்க சார் ஆமாங்க சார் ஆமாம் சார் ஸ்டெப்டு பார் எடுத்துட்டு அதே மாதிரி ஒரு டேப்பட் பார் மாதிரி எடுத்து பண்ணுறது ஓ சரிங்க சார் ஓகேங்க சார் ஓகே சார் யூஸ்ஃபுல்லாக இருக்கும்ல ஓகே தானே இல்லை ஆல்ரெடி நான் பண்ணுறேன் இல்லைங்க சார் இல்லைங்க சார் யூஸ்ஃபுல்லாக தான் சார் இருக்கும்ல ஆல்ரெடி ஆள் எடுக்கலைங்க சார் நீங்கள் இருங்க ஓகேங்க சார் ஓகே சார் இருக்காங்க <laughs> 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 தெரிஞ்சுக்கிட்டோம் <laughs> 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 இருக்காங்க <laughs> 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 போகும் <laughs> 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 சார் நம்ம ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணிருமா சார் அடுத்த பார்ட்ஸ் வரவங்க வரட்டும் ஓகே நீங்க சொல்லுங்க சொன்னீங்க 
நான் ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணிடலாமா சார் ஆ ஓகே ஆ ஓகே சார் நான் ஃபார்மலா இன்ட்ரோ பண்ணிட்டு ஸ்டார்ட் பண்ணிடுறேன் சார் ம் ஓகே சோ குட் மார்னிங் டு एवरीवन சோ ஐ வெல்கம் யூ ஆல் ஃபார் திஸ் 12 டேஸ் ஷார்ட் டம் கோர்ஸ் ஆன் ஃபைனல் டர்ம் அனாலிசிஸ் சோ டுடே இஸ் a டே 5 செஷன் 1 a topic on the topic of solutions of uh, problems from solid mechanics linear bar and stepped bar element so this session is handled by dr s nagan sir uh, professor civil department kr college of engineering madurai so so he has uh, completed his bachelor degree in civil engineering kr college of engineering madurai during the year of 1990 he completed his master degree in structural engineering and one kr uh, college of engineering madurai topic on the topic of solutions of uh, problems so, from solid mechanics PhD, linear in civil engineering madurai kamaraj university so this year of is handled by dr s nagar sir so, uh, vast experience in civil in department kr uh, college of engineering kr college of engineering psna that's so, not personal engineering uh, completed his uh, bachelor uh, degree and he has published uh, around uh, 34 international journals related with the, uh, with in civil engineering field so he has published conference papers uh, around 10 so he, he has published book cha- books in the field of engineering mechanics uh, in engineering mechanics statistics and dynamics and also engineering mechanics pure dynamics and he, he completed his completed sponsored research project uh, in relevant dst and aict Uh, three project he has completed uh, two uh, principal invest- investigator one is a mentor so next uh, he has attended so many conferences workshops uh, in reputed institutions like nit surukkal iit madras iit mumbai uh, he has organized so many uh, webinars and conferences and workshops in kerala college of engineering national level and also international level um he guided he guided and also supervised many phd scholars uh, and uh, around uh, 25 and also ongoing phd scholar phd is going on under his guidance so he has delivered so many lectures in various reputed institutions um, in ramkul sir technology and kln vikram sedu ssm vet value so in the relevant field like uh, fine film analysis and uh, engineering mechanics and also properties of surfaces and solids and fine uh, analysis using ansys application of fpm like that so the uh, awards and recognition so best iist faculty advisor in the iist new delhi so he has a fellowship of inae uh, he is active member in iist life membership and also international society for environmental protection fellowship and other achievements uh, He is a reviewer of structural concrete and building, uh, members in AICT and EVC. So, with these short introductions, uh, I welcome Dr. Nagan, Nagan, Nagan sir to start this session. So, I hand over the session to uh, Nagan sir. Welcome, you sir. Sir, please unmute your uh, mic, sir. very good morning to you all sir do you hear me ah yes sir yes sir clear sir okay so good morning to you all again uh, actually uh, this topic will be ha- handling the solid mechanics problems okay by finite element approach using finite element approach you will see the step by step procedure of solving a one dimensional problem using this finite element technique okay and hope we might have had uh, the introductory lectures on the finite element concept basic concept definitions etc however i recall what is the basic concept again okay actually a geometrically complex domain the geometrically complex domain of the problem will be represented as a collection of geometrically simple subdomain called finite elements that is the basic concept of uh, this finite element method and and uh, will be in the mathematical form definition if you want to give the very well we all very well know that any field problem to take any field problem it is governed by a differential equation okay we all know the 
differential equation for our, our fluctual problem is ei d squared y by dx squared equal to mxx. That is a well-known uh, uh, differential equation for our beam problem, all our beam problems. So by solving the differential equation, what do you get? We get the value of y, okay, a d squared y by dx squared equal to mx means y is the deflection at any point. So we'll be getting the deflection. So by solving the differential equation, we'll be getting the value of y using boundary conditions at all. So what we do in fine element technique is instead of solving the differential equation directly, we'll convert the differential equation into finite element equations. Yeah, that is the thing, that is the basic thing. We'll convert the differential equation into finite element equations. And finite element equations are nothing but set of simultaneous equations. Okay, set of simultaneous equations involving the unknown value, involving the unknown nodal values. Okay. So instead of solving the differential equation directly, if you convert into sorry, simultaneous equations, solving simultaneous equations will be easier compared to solving the differential equation. That is the idea behind the fine element method. And the basic steps involved in fine element method will be, the first step will be the finite element discretization. Okay, first finite element discretization. Second step will be derivation of the element equation. We need to derive equation for one particular element. Okay, and I'll say, you, I'll tell you what is discretization. Okay, discretization means dividing into discrete number of elements. Discretization means dividing into discrete number of elements. Okay. Say, for example, you have a cantilever beam of length uh, 1 meter or 3 meters. What you can do is you can divide it into small, small elements of 100 mm length or 200 mm or a second. Yeah. So that procedure is called discretization, dividing into discrete number of elements. Then, derivation of element equation. After dividing into elements, we need to derive equation for one particular element. That equation we call as the finite element equation. Finite element equation. And then we need to assemble the element equation because only when we assemble, you will get the original structure or original domain. Okay, so that that is the next step. And convergence. So convergence means nearing the exact solution. So when do we get the exact solution? That is called convergence. So these are the basic steps involved in any finite element analysis technique. Either you do manually or you do using uh, finite element softwares. So everything involves these steps. Okay, even if you are uh, approaching a problem by you might have start, solve the finite element approach by ANSYS. Okay, so what do you do? Initially, you need to create the model of the problem. You need to discretize. Okay, divide into discrete number of elements. Okay, and then it, instead of deriving element equation, what we will be doing is the software will compute the element stiffness matrix, the element force matrices, etc. And then it will assemble to get the global stiffness matrix. That is the stiffness matrix for the entire structure. Assembly procedure will be done, taken care by the program, already written program. Then once the assembled equations are in hand, then it will solve. Then the basic finite element equation which we have is capital K into capital Q equal to capital F. I'll be telling you these things subsequently when solving uh, one dimensional problems, solve mechanics problems also. Okay. So, so capital K into capital Q into equal to capital F is the universal uh, finite element equation. That's a basic logic equation also. So capital K means stiffness. How do we define stiffness? Stiffness is force by displacement. Okay, force by displacement multiplied by capital Q. Capital Q is the displacement. So force by displacement into displacement should yield you displacement. So that is the basic finite element equation. Capital K into capital Q equal to capital F. And this versatile equation we can apply to any field. In structural problem views, we call K as stiffness matrix and Q as displacement and F is the forces. Say the applied force may be body force, traction force, etc. Okay. In whereas if you have the same problem if you solve in electrical field, then K will be the electric flux or something, and Q will be the parameters, unknown parameters in the electric field. And Q, uh, the forcing function will be on the right side. What are the force or the intensity of uh, electricity applied? So that will be on the right side. So forcing function will always be on the right side. Left side you will have a stiffness and displacement. So this is the basic finite element equation. And then convergence. So how do we get convergence? By increasing the number of elements. Say if you divide into four elements, you'll get one value. If you divide into six number of elements, you'll get the value still accurate than the earlier. Similarly, if you keep on increasing the 
number of elements, then you will get the convergence. That is, our model will represent the original domain. Okay, that is called convergence. Okay, so with these basic steps, uh, now we will go to the uh, our solid mechanics problems. I okay. will uh, uh, discuss the step by step procedure of solving a uh, solid mechanics problem by finite element method. Okay, as we discussed, the first step is in every problem, any problem is discretization and making the finite element model. Okay, discretization and discretization and making the finite element model. Okay, so this is the given problem. This is the problem we need to solve using the finite element technique. So it is an axially loaded bar. Okay, this problem is a very basic uh, applied mechanics problem. Okay, say a load is applied here. A load is axially uh, axial load is applied here, and it's a stepped bar. Okay, we have two cross sections. The cross section this is 20 mm square, and cross section of this is 10 mm square. Okay, axially loaded bar. So axially loaded means uh, load applied along the axis of the member. Okay, our ultimate objective is to find the stress in each element. Okay, find the stress in each element. So as a first step, we need to divide into discrete number of elements. That is called discretization. So here, this is having one cross section area. This is having another cross section area. Therefore, necessarily we need to divide into minimum two number of elements. Okay, we need to uh, minimum two number of elements are to be considered for discretization. Okay, suppose if if you have one more area, say here uh, this is 20 mm squared and other another part is 15 mm squared and then 10, then you need to divide into three elements. So as per the requirement of the uh, field problem. You need to discretize into two or three or any number of elements. Okay. Similarly, say the the length, the area of cross section may be same. Some in some problems, the area of cross section may be the same, but we may be having the uh, first part as copper and second part as aluminium. Okay. You will be having different uh, elements also or different materials also. So in that case also, you need to divide into two elements or three elements as the requirement of the actual problem. Okay. So here the two elements. A minimum two elements are required because this is having cross section area, this is having another cross section area. Therefore, let the given bar be discretized into two finite elements. Okay, so this is element one and this is element two. Okay, this is the first discretization procedure, and then we are making this as a finite element model as shown below. Okay, as shown below, you can see the finite element model at the bottom. So Okay. So this is the finite element model of the problem, which is two element, three nodes finite element model. Okay, we have taken two elements and three nodes. Say each element, each element will be connected at by two nodes. Okay. Element one is connected by node one and two, and element two is connected by node two and three. So we, the uh, final, the resultant with two element, three node finite element model. This is the first step in any problem. You need to divide into discrete number of elements, may divide the model, and then have the finite element model as a line element, as line. Because for all one dimensional problems, we will be using what are called as line elements or what are called as bar elements. Okay, line elements are bar elements. So the elements suitable for one dimensional problem solving will be line elements or bar elements. So here we have used line elements, therefore, we have represented the entire structure as using line, okay, two line elements. And element numbering always you remember it should be encircled. The element number should be encircled, and node number should be left as such. A okay, node number, say node number one, node number two, similarly node number three. So you leave them. So not to differentiate between node numbering and element numbering. I'm saying this always element number will be encircled. Okay. Suppose you have three elements. Then how what, what will be the final model? You will be resulting in three element, four node of final model. Because each element will be connected by two nodes. So this is the first step. Either you solve using ANSYS or Abacus or any finite element software, you need to model the uh, thing first. Okay? Whatever problem you have, first model is using this same technique. In case of ANSYS or any software, what you'll be doing, the inbuilt elements will be there. Instead of line elements, they'll be having their own element. So you need to assign that element to make the finite element model. So that is the thing. So this is how you should learn any uh, method. Okay, how we are going to solve using software and how using manually how you need to solve. So everything you need to be clear and what is actually happening inside the software that also you should know. Simply if you give us any input, 
will be getting definitely some output so that be, that should not be the case you should know what you are giving what is happening inside the software and what does it computes what is the result we get whether that is justifiable everything you should know okay and another example say so this is a clear example you have two uh, different cross sections okay the, so we have easily formed the two discretization process by converting into two elements in case if you have a tapered bar like this say so it may also be given tapered sections like this okay tapered sections like this say the top width is 152.4 mm the bottom width is 76.2 mm and the length of the element is 609.6 okay in, in in this type of problem they may give either load at the midpoint or they may give load at the uh, free end okay this end is fixed so they can give load at any point so now it is our option to have any number of elements okay we can divide this uh, trapezoidal bar into two elements as we did in the first case or we can divide into three elements one for this portion two this portion three or four number of elements if you want to get more accuracy then the number of elements need to be increased so when you solve manually you can have minimum number of elements as required and when you want to solve using software you can have more number of elements because that will be taken care by the software by itself okay so now you see how we create the final degree model of this problem okay so this is the tapered section what we need to do is we need to convert the tapered section into a stepped bar like this okay this is a stepped bar okay as in the case first uh, first case we have a stepped bar so convert the trapezoidal section or the inclined section into stepped bar like this so how do we convert that is shown here say we have say this is the tapered uh, cross section tapered cross section what i am doing is i am simply dropping a vertical line here okay similarly i am dropping a vertical line here similarly in the second section i am dropping a vertical line i am dropping a vertical line thereby i will get a stepped bar like this okay so if you want to make a stepped bar simply we can't uh, have this values as such so what we need to do say so that the top width is 152.4 bottom width is 76.2 obtain the width at the midpoint so the width at the midpoint will be average of these two 152.4 plus 76.2 divided by 2 will be the width width at the center now we are making this trapezoidal into a rectangle so again you need to average these two values so that is done here 152.4 plus 114.3 114.3 is the uh, intermediate width so 114.3 divided by 2 will give the width here okay, it will give the width here okay. now what is the width for this second section say 114.3 is the width at the center and 76.2 is the width at the bottom average of these two okay 114.3 uh, plus 76.2 divided by 2 will be the width at the for the bottom section okay, i will explain again say i have tapered section so simply drop vertical lines like this so by dropping vertical line what we actually we are doing that is here you see some portion is left out and that portion is included here similarly here by dropping a vertical line we are omitting some portion and we are including some portion thereby the error is not much we call this as compensating error okay as we do uh, in case of civil engineering we say surveying we have compensating errors here also we can compensate whatever you have left out you can include here so that way you are not affecting the original structure Okay, so drop a vertical line. Similarly, drop a vertical line here. You get a rectangular section. Similarly, here drop a vertical line. Drop a vertical line. You get another rectangle. That way, you get two elements like this. And what should be the width of each element? The top width is 152.4. The intermediate width is 114.3. The average of these two will be the width for this entire uh, cross section. And then 114.3 at the midpoint, 76.2 at the bottom. Average of these two will be the width for this. Okay, you may think or you may ask. what is the need for converting into a stepped bar like this why don't we solve as such having a trapezoidal section as such okay i tell you the reason say this is element 1 and this is element 2 say if i want to get the area of cross section of element 1 we want to get the area of cross section 1 so how what is a cross sectional area the width multiplied by thickness okay the width say here we have the width width of the section multiplied by the thickness perpendicular to this Okay, thickness that will give you the cross section area you should not multiply uh, the width by you not you should not multiply width by the length that is not cross section area that is that will be longitudinal area so if you want to get cross section area the width multiplied by thickness that will give you the cross section area so in case of trapezoidal uh, tapered section what you have if i divide simply into two then 
I can't get the cross section area at uh, at any point. Say if I the cross section at the top will be different, cross section at this point will be different, cross section at this point will be different. So it will be having varied cross section over a length. And if you have a tapered bar as such, it will have varied cross section. Why do we have varied cross section? Because the width will be varying at different levels. Width multiplied by thickness is the cross sectional area. So it will be having varied cross section area. So not to make it constant cross section area for an element, we are converting in the tapered section into a uh, rectangular section like this. So if you take, if you, anywhere if you take along this uh, point, here width multiplied by thickness will be area. Similarly, if you take here, width multiplied by thickness will be the same area. So that is the objective of converting a tapered section into a rectangular section like this. Similarly, this section, the width multiplied by uh, that particular thickness will give you cross section area of this element. And you can make this into a final model like this, line element. Using line elements, the first portion is element 1. The second portion is shown as element 2. Now we have got a 2 element, 3 node finite element model. So this is the first step in any finite element problem <coughs> using hot solid mechanics problems. Okay, We need to convert into, uh, you need to discretize and then make the finite element model. Is it clear? Okay. That's how we'll go, go to the next step. Step two, okay. step one is discretization and making the fine element model. And step two is the element stiffness matrices. Okay. We need to form the element stiffness matrices. And this step depends on the type of element which we use. Okay. The type of element which we use for making the model of the problem. Here, this is a one dimension problem. So we are using line elements or bar elements. Okay. Line elements or bar elements. So for one dimensional line elements, for one dimensional line elements or bar elements, the element stiffness matrix is given by AE by LE, AE by LE, 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. Okay? This is the formula, element stiffness matrix formula for all the line elements. And this, this is derived based on potential energy approach. Okay? Derivation, if you want to see, you can uh, refer at standard textbook, and this will be derived based on the potential energy approach or other approaches. You can easily derive the element stiffness matrix. Now we'll know what are the terms. What is AE, what is EE, and what is LE. And similarly, KE. See, always the suffix E represents element. Okay, element stiffness matrix. Small k is element stiffness. Okay, so KE is small element stiffness matrix. AE, area of element. And EE, length smallness of the element. LE, length of the element. And these are the constants. 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. Okay. Now, I would like to tell you what is this 1, 2 and this 1, 2. This is more important when solving any problem. We need to write this 1, 2, 1, 2. I'll tell you what is 1, 2. See, this is nothing but we call here, I mentioned this DOF numbers. DOF means degree of freedom. Okay, degree of freedom. So you need to know what is degree of freedom. In case of one dimensional problems, okay, in case of one dimensional problems, each node, each node will be permitted to have one degree of freedom. Okay, each node will be permitted to have one degree of freedom. In case of two dimension problems, each node will be having two degrees of freedom, one in the x direction, another in the y direction. In case of three dimension problems, each node can free is free to move along x axis, along y axis, and along z axis. So three degrees of freedom. So here we are solving one dimension problem. So we have three nodes. Okay, we have three nodes, and element one is connected between node one and two. Element two is connected between node two and three. Similarly, if you have one more element that will be connected between three and four, likewise it will go in. Okay, any element will have two nodes. So those node numbers I am writing here. The node numbers one, two, one, two. Similarly, if I am forming element stiffness matrix for element two, how I should replace this? I should replace this by two, three, two, three. Okay, I should write this as two, three, two, three. And uh, say if there are students here, they you need to know. You just write this numbers, DOF numbers, degree of freedom numbers, or the element connectivity. You can say okay, element one is connected between node one and two. So this numbers, you please write using pencil, okay? Because otherwise they will get confused with the actual value. So you write this node numbering or the degree of freedom numbering using pencil one two one two. And this is more essential. I'll tell you the need uh, why we are writing this. I'll tell you the need subsequently. Okay. Similarly, if you are writing for forming the element stiffness matrix for element two, then this will be this will become two three and this will become two three for element three three four three four likewise the connectivity always should be compulsorily or necessarily written at the top and the at the side okay 
So this is for one dimensional line elements. Similarly, if you are using truss elements, say if you are solving a truss problem, okay, if you are using a truss problem, then the same elements of this matrix gets modified as a e by l e l squared l m minus l squared l m. So they have a separate formula for truss elements. Similar for every element, we have its own element stiffness matrix formula. And these element stiffness matrix can very easily derived using the potential energy approach. Okay, the potential energy will be sum of the uh, strain energy and work potential. So based on that, they will derive this, and you can easily derive for any particular element. Now we are solving one dimensional problems, so I will restrict to this one dimensional problems formula. Okay. And in case of software, in case of software, say ANSYS or any software, these element stiffness matrix matrices will be inbuilt. Okay. You need to specify the type of element which you are going to model uh, for model the problem, which you are using for the model of the problem. Okay. For example, if I am uh, solving or I make the model of a RCC reinforcement concrete beam model, okay, that model I will be using uh, what is called a solid 65 element for making the model final model of the beam. Okay, solid 65. So solid 65 for that uh, element, they, they will have its own uh, ele beam element formula for element stiffness matrix. So using that, it will compute that element stiffness matrix. Now we are going to use uh, line elements. So line element formula is A E by L E 1 minus 1 minus 1 accompanied by the degree of freedom numbering. That is more important. You should not forget to write the degree of freedom numbering. Okay. Similarly, for uh, truss element, how what is the, what are those variables I have mentioned? So these things uh, I'll not tell you. So similarly for triangular elements, if you are solving two dimensional problems, you have triangular elements and in that case, how to form the element stiffness matrix. So everything is formula oriented only. So you need to have the formula, the substitute, you will get the element stiffness matrix. Okay. Similarly for all higher order elements, say maybe in the subsequently you will be studying in the other classes about higher order elements. So in case of higher order elements, how to find the element stiffness matrix? It will deal with double integration, okay, double integration. And whenever you have double integration, that can very well be accommodated, uh, taken care by numerical integration. That's why all the finite element softwares, they use uh, numerical integration technique to find the double integration uh, and thereby calculate the element stiffness matrix. Okay? So this is the step two. So I recall step one is finite element discretization and making the finite element model. Step two is uh, forming the element stiffness matrix. Okay? Then step three. So, in a similar way, we need to form the element force matrices. Okay? We need to form the element force matrices. And we know what are all the forces uh, taking care of in case of solid mechanics problems. So, in solid mechanics problems, what are the forces we need to uh, take care of is the element body force or the self weight. Okay? The element body force or the self weight. So, this is the element body force matrix. So, element body force matrix is given by F multiplied by AL by 2, 1, 1. Okay? F a L by 2, 1, 1. Okay. So I will tell you what is the, uh, the what is the logic behind this? Okay. Element body force. Body force means self weight. Okay. How to calculate self weight? Normally, now how will you calculate self weight? Say if you know the weight density of any material. Okay. If you know the weight density of any material, that weight density multiplied by volume. Okay. Weight density multiplied by volume gives you the total weight or total force acting due to the self weight. Okay. So here uh, that what uh, that is, has been done. Okay, we have F, we have F, F is the unit weight, sorry, specific weight of the material. So specific weight normally it will be in kilonewton per meter cube. So for example, specific weight of steel is 78.5 kilonewton per meter cube. Okay, this is 78.5 kilonewton per meter cube multiplied by volume. So volume is given by area of cross section into length. Okay, so what will happen, what will get you by multiplying by doing this specific weight multiply volume give you the total weight and total weight is divided by 2. Why it is divided by two? Because the element, the line element, is connected by two nodes. Okay, line element uh, is connected between two nodes. So whatever the weight you have, that weight will be shared equally to the two nodes. Okay, each node will have carry half the uh, self weight. Therefore, F into AL by two multiplied by one node. That is the logic behind this uh, body force matrix formula. Okay. So, in case of solid mechanics problems, you will be given the specific weight of the material or you will be given a specific weight of material. Say, first part is aluminium, second part is copper, third part is steel. So, likewise, they will mention. So, for each element, you need to compute this element body force matrix using this formula. For which you need specific weight of each material or weight density. Okay, weight density is required. Area of cross section already you will be having. Length, you might have divided into uh, different lengths. So, L will be having. Then, FAL by 2, 1, 2, 1, 1 will give you the element body force matrix. Okay. Then, element traction force matrix. 
So sometimes we also involve traction force. So what is meant by traction? The surface traction. So we will be having magnetic traction, or in case of fluid mechanics problems, we will be having uh, surface drag. Okay, that drag or magnetic force or electric traction. So these are called as traction force. So how to accommodate the traction force? Same concept. So traction force normally T. Say so traction force is T. You need to know the unit for this. So if you know the unit, then you can easily understand the meaning. So traction force is force per unit length. Okay, force acting over unit length. So force acting over unit length multiplied by length will give you the total force divided by two. Why do you divide by two? Because we have two nodes for element. So T L by two into one one. So very simple. How to remember the logic? If you know the logic, then formula. Remember the formula is very easy. Okay, you need not remember at all. Just you can arrive from the logic. And I want self weight. So I want self weight, which is nothing but specific weight multiplied by volume. And I am going to distribute to the two nodes connecting the element. Therefore, divide by two, multiply by one one. Because in matrix form, we need to do. That's why one one. Similarly, here traction force. T is the. In case of one-dimensional problems, traction force is force per unit length. And in case of two-dimensional problems. Traction force will be force per unit area. So in that case, you need to multiply by the area and divide to the supporting nodes. So that is the basic thing. Okay. Yeah. So this is this step um, uh, involves finding the element force matrices. Okay. So step one, discretization, making the finite element model. In this problem, we have discretized into two elements and make made the two element three node finite element model. And step two, element thickness matrix. The element thickness matrix is given by A area of element x one plus element divided by length of element into one minus one minus one plus one accompanied by the degree of freedom numbering and then step three forming the element force matrices force matrices we have body force matrix and traction force matrix body force matrix given by this and traction force matrix given by this okay then step four step four is the assembly of the global stiffness matrix capital K okay the global stiffness matrix capital K here global means say you have the original structure. We are dividing into discrete number of elements. So for each element, we will be having their own element thickness matrix. Similarly, we will be having element force matrices. Okay. So when you assemble the elements to get the original structure, then that is called the global thickness. Element thickness added together to get the global thickness. So how we know we should know how to form the global thickness matrix. So it is represented by capital K. Element thickness matrix is represented by small k. Global thickness matrix is represented by capital K. Okay, we need to know we need to know the properties of K. How do we form capital K? So the properties of capital K are K is symmetric. Finally, if you after forming capital K matrix, if you see that will result in with the symmetric matrix. So what is meant by symmetry? If we take the leading diagonal, okay, if we take the leading diagonal, if the elements above and below the leading diagonal are identical, then that is symmetric. Okay, symmetric matrix, and then Size of capital K. How to form this K? Size of capital K is given by n cross n, where n is total degrees of freedom. Okay, where n is total degrees of freedom. Okay, let us take our example. We have uh, three nodes. Okay, we have node one, node two, node three. Each node will have one degree of freedom in case of one-dimensional problems. Therefore, how many total degrees of freedom will be having? Will be having three degrees of freedom. Therefore, if you want to form capital K, the size of capital K will be. The size of capital K will be n cross n. Okay, so n is three. Therefore, three by three. So you need to form a matrix of size three by three, and we need to fill up the values. I'll tell you how to fill the values of global surface matrix while solving the problem. That then we will understand a better way. Okay, right now you you just know what is global surface matrix capital K. Then step five. In a similar way, you assemble the global force matrix. Okay, global force matrix, and the size of global force matrix is. N cross one. Okay, the size of capital K is N cross N. Size of capital F is N cross one. Therefore, what will be the size in the whenever problem? We have N is three. Okay, three degrees of freedom. Okay, so totally we have three nodes. Each node will have one degree of freedom. Therefore, three degrees of freedom. So three by one is the size of capital F. So we need to assemble all the body forces. We need to assemble all the traction forces and F P. So I have written F is equal to F B plus F P plus F P. Okay, F B plus F P plus F P. So F B is the global body force, F T is the global traction force, and F suffix P is the globally applied point load. Okay, globally applied point load. So that will give you the global force matrix. Okay, when so in solving problem, you clearly understand how we form this 
uh, global force matrix and all. Okay. Next, finite element equation. The finite element equation. This is what I referred initially. The global, uh, the finite element equation, the universal finite element equation, which you can very well remember for any problem, not only for structural problem, for any problem. This is the basic finite element equation. Capital K into capital Q equal to capital F. In case of applied mechanics or solid mechanics problems, we call this capital K stiffness. This is displacement, and this is force. And the basic logic behind this is K is stiffness. Stiffness is defined by defined as the force required to cause unit deflection. That is force by deflection. So force multiplied by deflection multiplied by deflection to give you the forcing function. Okay. In finite element equation we need to form. So uh, what do we get by what is the main advantage of this finite element equation? What do you get after this? That is capital K will be having say for example three by three matrix. Capital Q will be having three by one matrix. F will be three by one matrix. K will be having set of. So if we expand this matrices, we will be getting set of simultaneous equations. Okay, you will be getting set of simultaneous equations. So once you solve the simultaneous equation, we will be getting the unknown nodal values. So this Q is unknown. In capital K, it is known force is known because that we are applying. So force is known. Only unknown is the displacement field is unknown. So if you have three nodes, we will be getting Q1, Q2, Q3. If you have four nodes, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. So you need to obtain the uh, displacement, displacement values. Okay. So if by solving the simultaneous equation, we will be getting the displacement values. So in all finite element problem, this unknown displacement will be the finally we will be getting the result as this will be the final result we will be getting. Okay. This will be this is the solution we will be getting in all finite element uh, problems. Okay. The unknown values, unknown nodal values will be the final uh, solution. And after this, after getting this uh, uh, nodal values, then we can go for post processing. So what is post processing? So once you know the displacement, okay, once you know the displacement, then we will be al already knowing the strain displacement relationship. We okay? will be knowing the strain displacement relationship. So using the displacement, you can obtain strain. Then using the stress strain relationship, you can obtain the stress values. So this is how we will proceed for the post processing. So in all the post processing, in case of final software, what they will do? They will give you the uh, stress contour. They will give you stress contour in a pictorial diagram. Okay, they will give you a one by the stress. They will give you principal stresses. Okay, any stress we want, you can calculate. Similarly, they will give you the reaction components, reaction values. So everything, these things are the post processing. So in anything, we will be having three stages. One will be pre-processing. Next will be processing or solution phase, and then post processing. Okay, in the pre-processing, we will be giving all the necessary inputs required for a problem, like what we are doing here. Okay, we are making the model of the problem. We are finding the, are giving all the values, input values like area of cross-section, things more or less everything we are giving, and then the uh, solution phase starts. It, it computes the element stress matrix, it computes uh, element force matrices, it computes global stress matrix, and it computes global force matrix, and then it forms a finite element equation, forms a finite element equation, which are nothing but set of simultaneous equations. So solution of simultaneous equation will be already inbuilt in the program. So that using that you will be getting the unknown displacement field. So once unknown is obtained, then it will go for post processing using the standard relationships which we have for the problems. So this is what is happening in any finite element software. Okay. And once you know thoroughly this finite element concept for one dimension problems, extending this to any two dimensional or three dimensional or trust problems will be easier because these are the basic steps. The only thing that is going to differ is the element stiffness matrix and element force matrix. Okay, similarly, the model will be uh, differing for any problem. Once you make the model, then element forming element stiffness matrix will be differing for problem to problem or element to element. For one dimension, it will be line elements, for two dimensions, it will be triangular or rectangular elements or quadrilateral elements. For three dimensions, it will be beam elements or solid elements or shell elements. Okay, so the stiffness matrix will be varying for element to element. Other things are same. Every in every problem you need to assemble the global stress matrix. Every problem you need to assemble the global force matrix. Every problem involves forming finite element equations. Every problem involves solution of the finite element equations using the standard uh, solving simultaneous equations approach. Any method they'll be using using frontal solvers or any solvers they'll be using. So those things are standard. And then finding the after the post processing, it will depend on the type of the problem. So these are the things you need to know. So after forming the finite element equation. The next step will be handling the boundary conditions. Okay, handling the boundary conditions. How we are going to handle the boundary conditions? Why this is required? 
because uh, in this step, in the previous step, find the limit equations that will give you, for example, three equations, three unknowns. Okay, if you have q1, q2, q3, then you will have three equations, three unknowns. So if you solve directly, then it will be uh, say waste of time. So you need to the memory space will also be more. If you substitute the known boundary condition and then solve, the unknown will get reduced. For example, in our problem, the left end is fixed and right end is free. So on the fixed end, finally, the displacement should be zero. So that value is fixed. So we identify the fixed degree of freedom. Okay? Then eliminate that and then go to the solution. That will result in uh, two equations, two unknowns. Okay? So I will while solving problems, I will really how to handle this elimination approach of handling the boundary conditions and then how do we get the results. There is also another approach called penalty approach of handling the boundary conditions. This approach, uh, mostly this approach is inbuilt in the all the softwares to handle the uh, boundary conditions and then so that's why when you, when you solve uh, using ANSYS also, it will ask for the support conditions. Why does it ask for support conditions? Because only when you give support conditions, the software will know which degree of freedom is fixed, which degree of freedom is zero. Okay, that that's how that, based on that. It will solve the uh, equations and will give you give you the other unknown total values. Then step eight, as I said, post processing. This element finding element stresses and all post processing. Okay, so once you know the displacement, so we know sigma stress is equal to Young's modulus into displacement strain. So E into strain, and epsilon is equal to strain is given by B Q, where B is called the element strain displacement matrix. So once you know displacement, based on displacement, you can get strain. Once strain is known, then stress can be obtained. Similarly, the final step will be the find the reaction components. See, in all the softwares, you may, you may have seen this. Finally, you'll be getting the reaction. Even if you use work with Stat Pro, finally, if you uh, click at the support, you'll get the support reactions. What are, so how we, do we get the find uh, support reactions or the reactions? So for that, we have the finite element equation. Sir, is it audible, sir? Sir, anyone? Hello? Hello? Brito, sir? Audible, sir. Okay, if anything goes wrong, then kindly intimate me, okay? Sir? Hello? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Ah, okay. So, find the reactions. So, reactions will be capital K into capital Q equal to capital F. This is the finite element equation, basic finite element equation we have. We modify this equation as K into Q equal to F plus R, the reaction component. So you can find the reaction using this equation. So if you want the reaction, then K into Q minus F. F shall be brought this side. Therefore, K into Q minus F, you can find the reaction. Okay, these are the steps involved in any uh, one dimensional or any finite element uh, solution technique. Now we will go to the actual numerical example. Okay. Then uh, you will understand in a better way how these uh, uh, steps are incorporated here. Okay. How do we do actually? So same problem. Consider the bar shown in figure. Axial force P equal to 20 Newton is applied as shown. Determine the nodal displacement, stresses in each element and reaction forces. Okay. So this first component is having area 20 mm square. Second component 10 mm square. Length of first element is 100 mm. Length of second element is 100 mm. Okay. Now, step one, discretization and FE model, finite element model. So the bar is discretized into a two element, three node at finite element model as shown in figure. Okay, We have two elements, three nodes, node one, node two, node three. Okay? So this is the first step. We are making the finite element model. So two elements we are using for this problem. And this table is element connectivity table. Okay? Element connectivity table. I'm writing this as element and this is node. So what is the first node for element? Then similarly, what is the second node for the element? Yeah, this is one, two. So node one, two means what is the first node? What is the second node? So element one. So this is element one. Element one is connected between nodes one and two. So that's what I have written, one and two. Similarly, element two, so element two, it's connected between node two and three. So this means the first node of element two is two. The second node of element two is three. There is a meaning of this element connectivity table. This connectivity table you might have seen in stat pro at all. So while forming the member incidences, if you have to form the entire structure, you see the member incidence. That is the connectivity that we give you. Number two is connectivity two and three. Number four is connectivity this. So like this, this is called the connectivity. And this will help us forming the element sickness matrix and 
uh, forming the global stiffness matrices. Okay. And in this step itself, we write what is A1. A1 means area of cross section of element 1, 20 millimeter squared. L1, length of element 1, 100 mm. A2, 10 mm squared. L2, 100 mm. Okay. So these things will be required for the next step. That's why I am writing area, length, even inks models also. You can write. Okay. If, it, if it is steel, inks models is 200 GPA or 2 into 10 power 5 Newton per mm squared. So write all these values and have in hand before going to the next step. So step 2, forming the element stiffness matrix and element force matrices. So initially we will form the stiffness matrix. So stiffness matrix is given by first I inform for element 1. So I am representing this as K1, small k1, A1, E1 by L1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, and I return the node numbers, okay, return the node numbers or degree of freedom numbers here. So node number 1, 2, 1, 2, because element 1 is connected between 1 and 2, okay. So now we substitute the values. What is A1? A1 is 20 mm square, things model as steel, so for 2 into 10 to 5, L1 is 100. 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1, 1, 2, 1, 2. So don't forget to write this 1, 2, 1, 2. Now you take the, the common value outside. So 10 power 4, I'll get 10 power 4. So 4, 4 and 10 power 4, I'll get. I'll take the 4, multiply inside. So 4 minus 4 minus 4 plus 4. Okay. You can take either 10 power 4 or 10 power 5 or 10 power 3. Okay. Whatever it may be. As per here, convenience, you can take the common term outside. So the element simplest matrix for element 1 is given by. 10 power 4 multiplied by 4 minus 4 minus 4 4 then this is 1 2 1 2 okay now i'll tell you the significance of this 1 2 and 1 2 okay say how do i read this uh, element of this matrix how do we read this element because this element should be read as 1 1 okay so the mat the software will read this 4 value 4 as 1 1 okay that, and that way it will it might be programmed similarly this minus 4 will be read as 2 1 Okay, 2, 1, minus 4. Similarly, this minus 4 is 1, 2. And this 4 is 2, 2. And this one, we should also have a practice to read the elements of the matrix. And 10 power 4 is common term. Okay, that is common. And these values, this is 1, 1, this is 2, 1, and this is 1, 2, and this is 2, 2. So remember, we read in this manner. Okay? And some books, they refer, they are reading some other way. Whatever way you uh, read, you have that consistently. See, I will be have, having consistently like this is. I will read this as 1, 1, this is 2, 1, this is 1, 2, and 2, 2. In a similar way, I need to read for all the elements. In each element, you should not change the uh, way of reading, the row and column. So here I am fixing this as 1, 1, this is 2, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 2. Okay. Next. The element 2. So element 2 is A2, E2 by L2, 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. So A2, E2 by L2, 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. Here I have numbering. 2, 3, 2, 3, because element 2 is connected between node 2 and 3. Therefore, A2, area of process of element 2 is 10 mm squared. Length modulus is 2 into 10 power 5. Length 100 mm, 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1, 2, 3, 2, 3. Okay. So if we simplify, you take the same common term, because so that you can uh, finally add anything. Uh, simplify you can easily. Okay. So 10 power 4, 2 minus 2 minus 2 plus 2, 2, 3, 2, 3. Now, how do we read these elements? These elements. So this element, this 2, should, will be read as 2, 2. This minus 2 should be read as 3, 2. This minus 2 should be read as 2, 3. And this 2 should be read as 3, 3. Okay? Any doubt in this? How to read the elements? If you have some other way of reading, then you follow that. Uh, follow that consistently, that's all. So one cannot uh, simply stick on do this my way of uh, reading. But if you have that, you adopt that consistently for the entire problem. Okay. Then the load matrices, the next step will be element force matrices. For example, element body force matrix of element 1 will be F into A1 L1 by 2 into 1 1. Here also I will be writing the node numbering. Element 1 is connected to node 1 and 2. That's why I will write 1 2. And this is weight density. So if weight density is given, Multiply, use the weight density. For example, weight density of steel is 78.5 kN per meter cube. You convert into Newton per mm cube because we have area in uh, mm squared and length in millimeters. So this is weight density. Weight density multiplied by volume will be give you the total load or total weight divided by 2. So th th these values will be given in the problem. And here simply I have used 0, 0 because I have not taken the self-weight and the traction components in this problem. 
have taken only the externally applied load. What is the effect due to the externally applied load at the free end? That's why I'm ignoring this. But you should know how to calculate the body force matrices like this. Okay, substitute the value of this F in proper units. That's all. You know, you have a formula FAL by 2. Similarly, traction force. Traction force also TL, TL1 by 2. T is the traction force. And traction force will be given as force per unit length. For example, it will be given as 50 kilonewton per meter. Okay, 50 kilonewton per meter. And you see, what is the other forces, the units of other forces? You have the same units here. You convert into Newton if required. Similarly, length, length you are having consistently as millimeter. Therefore, con con convert this uh, force by millimeter length, okay? Newton per mm or something. Then you multiply and have the numerical values. So, we'll be having the element body force value. Similarly, F1, similarly F2. You obtain F2 because we have two elements. Similarly, T1 and then T2. And have all these values in hand before going to the next step okay in this problem i am using zero because we are ignoring the effects of sulfide traction there is no traction okay that's why now this is more important how to assemble the global sickness matrix so please uh, try to listen carefully how we are assembling the global sickness matrix and how we get the global load matrix Hello, sir. Ah, you are visible, sir. Screen visible, sir. Visible, sir. So global stiffness matrix. So global stiffness matrix. The size of global stiffness matrix is n cross n. Okay, n cross n. What is n here in our problem? We have three nodes. Therefore, three degrees of freedom. Therefore, the size of global stiffness matrix is three cross three. You just don't don't see this. Please ignore this and directly come here. I'll tell you how I got this. Okay, you just ignore this. You just come here. So also, you just you don't see the values inside. No, don't see the values inside here. Just see what I'm telling. Okay, so capital K, capital K is a global stiffness matrix. Write the common term. Ten power four is a common term. Then write one two three one two three. Okay, please listen carefully. One two three one two three. What is this one two three? Size of global stiffness matrix is 3 cross 3. Therefore, I am writing 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Now, our job is to fill the values inside. To fill the values inside. How to fill the values? Say, how, how should I read this first element? 1, 1. Okay? First element should be read as 1, 1. So, this 1, 1 value is available, available in my element stiffness matrix. Okay? In element stiffness matrix of element 1, I have the value of 1, 1. So, just pick up from the element stiffness matrix and fill it up here. So 4 is the value here. Okay. Then this should be read as 2-1. Okay. This should be read as 2-1. So this 2-1 is also available in my element stiffness matrix of element 1. So value is minus 4. So fill up it here. Fill it up here. Then 3-1. I will not be having any 3-1 value. Please see in the element stiffness matrix whether you have 3-1. So you will not be having any 3-1. Therefore, 0. Okay. Therefore, 0. Therefore, 0. Then this 1-2. 1, 2 can be taken from element stiffness matrix, uh, 1, so minus 4. Then 2, 2, this is 2, 2. How do you read this? 2, 2. And 2, 2, how do I get 6? Please go to the element stiffness matrix. Let us go to the element stiffness matrix. So this element stiffness matrix for element 2, 2, 2 is 2. Okay, 2, 2 is 2. Similarly, in the element stiffness matrix for element 1, I have 2, 2 is 4. Okay, this 2, 2 is 4. Therefore, I have two values for 2, 2. So you should clearly understand how I get this uh, 6. Okay. So this 6, how do I get 2, 2? This 2 to element 2, 2 is available in element 1 as well in element 2. In the element 1, I have a value of 4. In element 2, I have a value of 2. Therefore, 4 plus 2, 6. So at this stage, you should understand why I get added at 2. Why I get added at node 2 alone? For all the other nodes I don't get added. Only at 2 I get, get added because the structure is divided into two elements and the two elements are joined at node 2. Node 2 is a common node. It joins the structure. That's why we get the stiffness values get added here. Whereas node 1 and 3 are free. So they will not get added. In case if you have one more element, say 1, 2, 3, 4, if you have four nodes, then at node 2 and 3 it will get connected or it will get added. Node 1 and 4 will remain 
independent. Okay, they'll get, they'll not get uh, added. They'll get have their own values. So the connecting nodes will always have the stiffness values added. That you should know. Okay, the six. Then how do we read this? Three two. Okay, three two. Three two is available in element stiffness matrix of element two minus two value. Then one three. One three is zero because uh, three one is zero. One three is also zero. Then this is two three. Two three is available in element stiffness matrix two minus two. Then three three. Three three value is also available in element stiffness matrix of two. Therefore two. So this is how we form the global stiffness matrix. Okay, how do you get global stiffness matrix? Global stiffness matrix are filled. First, the size of global stiffness matrix is n cross n, where n is total degrees of freedom. We have three nodes, so three degrees of freedom. Therefore, three cross three. Therefore, write one two three one two three. Then simply fill the values by picking the values from element stiffness matrix. Okay, in element stiffness matrix, we'll be having all these values: one one two one three one one two 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 three two one three two three and three three. All these values will be available in element stiffness matrix. Pick up the values and fill it up here. So this can very well be written as a subprogram or an algorithm. An algorithm can be written to add the stiffness values. Say you can write uh, uh, subroutines or subprograms for i equal to one to n, for j equal to one to n. You do this. So this is a very simple uh, procedure in uh, computer programming. So you can simply add a program to form the uh, global stiffness matrix. Okay. So that we can very well form. Or if you want to form manually, you can very well form manually like this. So this is the assembly procedure which you need to know carefully. And then what you need to remember is the size of capital K is n cross n. Say if you have three elements, if you have three elements, they will be having four nodes. Therefore, four by four will be the size of capital K. Okay. Then one more uh, property of capital K is we have studied is K is symmetric. You also check whether the finally resulted K matrix is symmetric. What do you mean by symmetric? If you take the leading diagonal here, leading diagonal is four six two. Four six two is the Leading diagonal. If you take the elements above and below the leading diagonal, they should be identical. Say, so you see whether they are identical. Minus four, zero, minus four, two, minus four, zero, minus two. So they are identical. Hence, K is correct. What we have found is correct because K should be always a symmetric matrix. Okay. This is how we should form the global stiffness matrix. Sim in a similar way, you need to form the global force matrix. A okay? global force matrix. So global force matrix is global body force matrix. Global traction force matrix plus globally applied point load matrix. Okay, global body force. So how do you form global body force? In a similar way, you need to form global body force. If you will be having element body forces, okay, this global body force size will be n cross one. N is three, so this will be a three by one matrix. So you need to assemble for node one. What is the uh, element body force component? For node two, it will get added. For node three, it will not get added. So you will get uh, F body force for element one. Then traction force. Traction force also allow two. Traction force for element one. Traction force for element two. So you'll be having uh, one, one by three. So one two three. Okay. First fill up. At node one, what is the traction value? At node two, what is the traction value? At node two, always traction value gets added. Then at node three, there will be independent value. So, so therefore, you get global traction force. Then globally applied point load. Point load also same. Right. One two three. And see what is the load available at node one. What is the load available at node two? What is the load available at node three? So in the given problem, we have applied load only at the free end. That is at the node three. Therefore, twenty newton. So units we need to maintain. Okay, units we need to maintain consistently. Either newton or kilo newton. We need to maintain. In models, we have used newton per mm square. Force is also newton. Therefore, twenty newton. So this is how we should form the global force matrix. Size of global force matrix is n cross one. Where n is three, therefore three cross one. We know how to form the global force matrix. In this problem, we are not included a body force traction force. In case if you encounter body force and traction force, there is no uh, harm. There is not a difficulty. I have explained how to find the global body force and global traction force. In a similar way, you can do and get this force matrix. Once you have capital K and capital F in hand, the next step is you can form the finite element equation. So what is finite element equation? Capital K. Into capital Q equal to capital F. So capital K, capital K we already have. Okay, we have formed capital K. We know how to form. Then capital Q, capital Q is the unknown displacement field. The displacement at nodes are the unknowns in this problem. Or in any final problem, the displacement the nodes will be the unknowns. So, so Q1, Q2, Q3. Q1 is the displacement at node one. 
q2 displacement node 2 q3 displacement node 3 equal to capital f 0 0 20 so this is how we will be getting the finite element equation so if we expand this equation what do you get if we expand this equation row by column multiplication say row by column multiplication you will result in with three L equations three unknowns three simultaneous equations involving three unknowns so solving the simultaneous equations will be easier compared to solving the differential equation as this how this is the main advantage of finite method in the partial in the differential equation we need to solve using several techniques to get the unknown but here what we do is we are converting the differential equation into finite element equations and finite element equations are nothing but set of simultaneous equations involving the unknown modal values solving the simultaneous equation you get the unknown values okay so instead of solving this as such before solving what we need we are going to do is we are going to substitute the boundary conditions of the problem and we will try to reduce the system of equations so if you are able to reduce the system of equations then we will be saving time as well the storage space could be saved in the software uh, computer so employing boundary conditions and solving for unknown displacement this is the next step employing boundary condition and solving for unknown displacement okay so the degree of freedom one is fixed so you just go to the problem the degree of freedom one is fixed how this is a given problem so this is a given problem so we are made into final model like this so this is degree of freedom one degree of freedom two degree of freedom three and simply you should not say because of fixed support i am not saying this is fixed it means the degree of freedom fixed means its value is fixed finally you should get the value should be zero so that value is fixed even if i have a hinge support here even if, if i have a hinge support here i will say that degree of freedom one is fixed that means uh, support is not fixed its value is fixed the value finally what we will be getting is known it's already known so that it's fixed Similarly, if I have a hinge support here at node 3, I can say degree of freedom 3 is also fixed. Okay, So degree of freedom fixed means it means that the value of degree of freedom is fixed. So in this problem, the degrees of freedom, what will be the fixed degrees of freedom? Degree of freedom 1 alone will be fixed. I need to find degree of freedom 2. I need to find degree of freedom 3. That is, I need to find Q2 and Q3, how to be found in this problem. So that will be done by elimination approach. We will be using elimination approach. You see how we do the elimination approach. So this is the original finite element equation. Capital K, capital Q, equal to capital F. So capital K into capital Q equal to capital F. So you identify the fixed degree of freedom. So the degree of freedom 1 is fixed. Therefore, eliminate. In the elimination approach, the rule is Eliminate first row, first column of the K matrix. Okay, eliminate first row, first column of the K matrix. Therefore, I am eliminating this first row, first column. I am getting 6 minus 2 minus 2, 2. Common term is there. Okay, so I get this. Okay, in the Q matrix, eliminate the first row alone. So, draw down the column. So, first row alone. So, eliminate Q1. So, Q1 is eliminated. I am resulting Q2 and Q3. In the F matrix also, eliminate the first row. We will be getting 0 and 20. So, this is the elimination approach. Okay, so eliminate the rows and columns corresponding to fixed degree of freedom of the K matrix. Okay, please listen. Eliminate the row and column corresponding to fixed degree of freedom of the K matrix. Eliminate the row corresponding to fixed degree of freedom of the Q1 F matrices. In Q matrix as well F matrix, eliminate the row corresponding to fixed degree of freedom. Okay, in case if your degree of freedom 3 is also fixed, for example, in our problem, if I am given uh, degree of freedom 3 is hinged, then we, I will say degree of 3 is also fixed. So, in that case, I will be doing eliminating first row, first column, third row, third column of the K matrix. Similarly, in the Q matrix, I will eliminate first row and third row. In the F matrix also, I will eliminate first row and third row. And then I will result in with only one unknown, say 6 Q2 equal to some value. Then I will get the unknown. So, this is the elimination approach for solving the uh, equations and by substituting the boundary conditions. So now we get reduced, the equation get reduced to two equations, two unknowns. So if we expand this, I'll get two equations, two unknowns. Solving, I'll get Q2 values, 5 to 10 power minus 4 mm. Why I get this unit as millimeters? Because this is the degree of freedom of the displacement. So displacement will have units of millimeters because we are having all area as well length uh, units are in millimeters. So therefore millimeters. Similarly, Q3 equal to 15 into 10 power minus 4 millimeter. So I am getting the displacement. 
Q2 and Q3 as 5 into 10 power minus 4 and 15 10 power minus 4 mm. Okay. So finally, I can write the displacement matrix as Q1, Q2, Q3. Q1 is 0 because it's a degree of freedom. 5 and 10 power minus 4, 15 10 power minus 4 millimeter. So this completes the uh, processing up to processing. We have up to solution phase, we are done. Now we are going to the post processing. With the obtained displacement values, what are the values you can extract or what are the values you can find using the uh, existing relationships between the various variables? Okay. So we all very well know uh, stress. You know, stress. Stress is given by Young's modulus into strain. Okay, Young's modulus into strain. And strain is given by BQ. I'll tell you what is B and Q. Okay. The strain is given by BQ matrix. Now all problems, either it be one dimensional or two dimensional or three dimensional, BQ is the uh, strain. B and Q will be the strain. And what is B? I'll tell you. Okay. So if I want to find stress in element one, stress in element one is given by E1 and B1. Okay. E1, E corresponding to element one, B corresponding to element one. And Q corresponding to element 1. You should not uh, wrongly write as Q1 alone. Okay, You should not write wrongly as Q1 alone. Here I have written E1 because Young's modulus corresponding to element 1. B, B matrix corresponding to element 1. And Q corresponding to element 1. Corresponding to element 1 means I have element 1, 2 nodes. Therefore, it will have two displacements, Q1 and Q2. Similarly, if we form for sigma 2, what is the formula? Sigma 2 will be E2, B2, Q2, Q3, because element 2 is connected between 2 and 3. Therefore, the displacement involved will be two values. Okay. Whereas Young's modulus is one value, element strain displacement is one value, Q will be two values because of having two nodes. So E1, B1, this Q1 and Q2. E1, 2 into 10 power 5. This B1, what is this B1? This B1 is called the element strain displacement matrix. B1 is called the element strain displacement matrix. And element strain displacement matrix given by 1 by length of element, okay, 1 divided by length of element, 1 by length of element, 1 by length of element, 1 by length of element to minus 1 plus 1, okay, into minus 1 plus 1 multiplied by Q1, Q2, okay, Young's modulus, B1 is 1 by length of element 1 into minus 1 plus 1 is the derivative, is the derived quantity. The element strain displacement matrix for one dimensional line element can be derived using the same uh, potential energy approach. They, they have derived this. Okay, So you can take the derivation 1 by length of element minus 1 plus 1 multiplied by Q1, Q2. Q1 value you know, Q2 value you know. So length of element is known. These are constants. So you will get sigma 1. That is stress in element 1 as 1 newton per mm square. Okay? Stress in element 1. In a similar way, we can find the stress in element 2. So how do you find stress in element 2? E2, Young's modulus of element 2, B2, and Q corresponding to element 2. Q corresponding to element 2. Corresponding to element 2 means it will be Q2 and Q3. Therefore, Young's modulus is 2 into 10 power 5. B2, 1 by L2, 1 by length of element 2 multiplied by minus 1 plus 1. This is the derived formula I told. And then Q2, Q3, you have the values. Substitute, say row by column. We need a multiple row by column to get 2 newton per mm square. Okay, stress in element 2 is 2 newton per mm square. Now we can check the values whether we have got the uh, right values by finite element approach. Okay, and we all very well know that it is a axially loaded applied mechanics problem. Okay, it's an ax axially loaded stepped bar problem. So finally, what you need to get, you should get the stress in uh, element 1 as load by area. Load by area will give you stress. So P divided by A1. What is the load? Applied load is 20. Area cross section of element 1 is 20. So if I get 1 newton per mm squared for sigma 1, then what all things I have done is correct. Okay. Similarly, sigma 2, load by area 2, load is 20 newton, the area cross section is 10, therefore 2 newton per mm squared. So at this stage, you may think that, so why do we get, instead of uh, applying the formula directly B by A, why do you do this laborious or uh, this uh, step by step procedure and all? Okay. So I'll tell you the significance of finite element analysis now. So what is the significance of finite element technique compared to ordinary applied mechanics approach? Okay. So in case if you have different materials, say my component one is aluminium and my component two is steel, okay, or if I have first is copper and then another alloy. So combination of materials, if you have different materials, then you can't check by check by this approach, this applied mechanics approach, you can't solve easily. So you need to use the, the uh, composite material. You need to consider this as a composite problem, then you need to analyze. Whereas any material variation, any geometric variation, any 
the thing can be easily accommodated any load variation okay load may be applied at any intermediate points those things can easily be accommodated in the pilot element approach because we have provision for everything say uh, using element simplex matrix i have provision to incorporate the area cross section at of every, every element Young's modulus. I have option to include, include the Young's modulus of different materials. It, it let it me comprise of n number of materials. Okay, I can have the I have the option. Okay, that is the main advantage of fundamental method. Similarly, load. So I can have load in between points. If you have load at in between points, then you can check by this load by area formula. Okay, so if I have in between load applied, if I have traction component, yeah, then I can't check using on and applied mechanics of approach. So including the sulfate, so sulfate component, everything is possible in the fundamental element. Thing. That's that's a uniqueness of the uh, versatility of the fundamental method. Similarly, the steps which we have seen so far: step one, discretization, making the fundamental model; step two, element stiffness matrix; step three, element force matrices; step four, uh, global stiffness matrix capital K; step five, global force matrix capital F; and step six, finite element equation capital K into capital Q equal to capital F; and then finding getting the unknowns, and then finding stresses, finding the I uh, think these things are, if you know, if you incorporate these steps in, you are writing a coding using these steps, then these steps can very well be mod modified to solve a two-dimensional problem or three-dimensional problem. So once you write a one-dimensional problem or coding or one-dimensional problem, then that can very easily be modified to solve any press problem or any two-dimensional problem or any three-dimensional problem of any. Uh, thing any loading condition in boundary conditions. The only thing we need to modify is we need to incorporate the element stiffness matrix formula for each element. Okay, if it's a two-dimensional problem, you will be you might be involving uh, tri triangular elements, rectangular elements, or quadrilateral elements. So once you incorporate the element stiffness matrix for those elements, then the program will uh, accommodate and then it will compute the element stiffness matrix for that particular element. Then element force matrix. If you incorporate the formula for the force matrix for that particular element, that that will be calculated. Then forming the global stiffness matrix that is common in everything, every problem, any problem that's common. You are going to assemble, so assembly procedure is a common thing. Then uh, forming the final element equation k into q equal to f that is a common thing. Solving the final element equations is a set of solving simultaneous equations that is a common thing. So everything is being common. So only the variable is the, the uh, model, formulation of the model as well the forming the element stiffness matrix and element force matrices. Other things are the same. That's why we call this fine element technique as a versatile tool for solving any field problem. Actually, initially, this fine element technique has been formulated uh, only for civil engineering applications. Okay, later it comes find its application in almost all fields. And now people use for solving electrical engineering, mechanical engineering problems, any engineering problems. Similarly, it has find its application in medical field, in biomedical field. Now, uh, fine element technique finds its uh, use in almost uh, many. Fields like a human blood flow analysis in biomechanics, that is in fracture studies of human bone and all, they use fine element technique. In sports field, fine element technique is used because of its versatility. Okay, versatility. The thing can be easily modified. Okay, the equation which you use can be easily modified to suit the application. So that's why people call this uh, ANSYS software. Even ANSYS software is called as ANSYS multi physics software because it can handle any physical problem. Only the boundary conditions will be varying. Only the elements which you are going to, for a different application will be varying. Other things will be going to be the same. Making the model, giving the input for the material properties, section properties, okay, giving the boundary conditions, applying the loading. Everything is going to be the same. Finally, getting the output. The output depends on different types of problems. Okay. Then the one more step here is we need to find the support reaction that is left out that I'll cover. So it's reaction force. So this we already discussed. Capital K into capital Q equal to F. We have the final element equation. So capital K into capital Q equal to F plus R. Therefore, I want the reaction R. R is equal to K into Q minus F. Well, we have all these values. K11, Q1, K12, Q2 plus K13, Q3 minus F3. So if you substitute the values, we we'll get the reaction. R1 is minus 20. So this step is more essential. This step is more essential to check all the things which you have done, whether it is correct or not. This step will check even what are maybe the type of problem. It may be uh, composite materials, uh, composite loading, anything. This step will be a check. This will check all the steps which you have done so far. Because this involves the stiffness values. This involves the displacement values. This involves the force values. 
So wherever if you have done any mistake, then this will indicate you are not not done correctly. So I am getting reaction as minus 20. That indicates my calculations, everything are correct. Because what is the reaction to be obtained? I am applying a load of 20 newton at the right end. So necessarily I should get minus 20 at the left end. At the support point, I should get opposite to the applied load. If I get that, then my entire solution is correct. Therefore, reaction if I get minus 20, that indicates it is correct. Okay. So in a similar way, any problem could be solved. Say this is an example of solving a tapered, uh, tapered section. Okay, so that this is a rectangle, this is a plate, tapered plate. Consider the plate shown in figure. The plate has a uniform thickness. Why the thickness of the plate is given? Because only using the thickness you can compute the area of cross section and Young's modulus. Young's modulus is given. Similarly, if you solve this problem, you can know we'll be knowing element body force and all. Okay. Everything will be known here. So the den weight density is given as 78.5 kiloton per meter cube. In addition to sulfide, the plate is subjected to a point load of 444.8 newton at its midpoint. Say here, at the midpoint, there is a point load. So compute the nodal displacement and element stresses. So how do we solve this problem? The first step will be discretization in an finite element model. So this bar need to be discretized into a stepped bar. So I'll be first converting this in the stepped bar as I explained earlier. So here, I'll be converting that the tapered bar be discretized into stepped bar having two elements. So this is element one, this is element two, and need to arrange the dimensions of each element. This is 152.4, this is 76.2, therefore the width at the midpoint will be average of these two, that will be 114.3, and again average, find the average to get the average width of the first uh, section, average width of the second section, find the average of these two, therefore I'll be putting 133.35 mm as the width of the first element, and this is length, 304.8 is the length of the element, which should not be read as uh, depth or something. So length of the element. And this is the uh, uh, average width is 114.3 plus 76.2 divided by 2. I'll be having the width here. This is length and thickness is given as 25.4 mm. So the resulting two element, three noted final element model will be as shown in figure. Okay, in the in the first example, they have been, they have been given the area. Now we are finding the area here. L1 length of element 1 is 304.8. Area 1, 133.5 is the average width obtained. Multiply by thickness 25.4. Therefore, 33.87.09 millimeter squared is the area of the element 2. Length of element 2. Length of element 2 is 304.8. Area of element 2 will be 95.25 into 25.4. How is this 95.25? See here we have obtained. 95.25 is the width of this. Similarly, 133.5 is the width of this section. Multiply multiplied by thickness. So I have A1, L1, A2, L2, etc. I will be having. So simply find the element stiffness matrix and element load matrices using the formula. Element stiffness matrix, how do you get? Area of element, x1, length of element, 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1, 1, 2, 1, 2. Therefore, area 1, Young's modulus, length is 304.8. Therefore, if taking common terms 10 power 5, 22.225 minus 22.225, etc. I need to write 1, 2, 1, 2. That's left out here. Please fill up here. 1, 2. 1, 2, and this 1, 2, 1, 2 will help me while arranging global stiffness matrix. Therefore, we should not forget to write. Okay. So, 1, 2, 1, 2, that should be written here. Then, say so here, uh, the, we can know how to find the global, sorry, element body force matrix. So, element body force matrix, how do you get F into AL by 2, 1, 1. For element, element body force for element 1 will be F into a1 L1 by 2 1 1. Okay. F is 7.8 in 10 power minus. How do you get this? F is specific weight, which is 78.5 kilo newton per meter cube. Convert and have it as newton per millimeter cube. So kilo newton means in multiply by thousand meter cube divided by thousand cube. That's all together you'll be getting this 7.8 in 10, 10 power minus 5 newton per millimeter cube multiplied by area in millimeter square, length in millimeters divided by 2 1 1. Therefore, finally, I will be getting F1 as 40.52, 40.52. Similarly, I get F2, element body force for element 2 will be, which will be varying, only the variation will be area, area and length will be varying, or will be getting. So here we need, we should not forget to write, this is 1, this is 2. What do you mean by 1, 2? That is, the element body force at node 1 is 40.52 Newton. The element body force at node 2 is 40.52 Newton. Here I should write 2, 3. The element body force at node 2 is 28.94. The element body force at node 3 is 28.94. 
So this will help me while assembling the global body force. Okay, in this problem I don't have traction force, therefore. So the rest of the things I think uh, I can complete. Uh, so it will be similar. Okay. So once you know the elements of the stress element uh, force matrices, then we need to form the a global stiffness matrix, a global force matrices, then finite element equation, then solving the finite element equation, getting the stresses, getting the reaction components, everything will be same. Only the thing modeling will be the that way difference. Okay. So with this, I stop my presentation and you can raise any doubts if you have. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So from the participant side, there is one question, sir. Yes. So, in, in what uh, for what condition penalty approach is followed, sir? Mm, very good. So, penalty approach. So, I didn't tell about the penalty approach. I will explain how penalty approach is handled. Actually, what they will be doing is uh, we we will be having the global stiffness matrix capital K. Okay, we have the global stiffness capital matrix capital K. The maximum value need to be taken. Okay, maximum value of the capital K need to be taken and multiplied by 10 power 4. That will give you a large number. Okay, that will give you a large number C. The procedure is outlined in all the textbooks. This I will explain and I will tell you the need. What is the need and where we need to use penalty approach. Okay? So you have that value, capital C in hand. And that value need to be added to the leading diagonal elements. Okay? That value need to be added to the leading diagonal elements whose degree of freedom is fixed. Okay? And we need to use the penalty approach. Okay? And that will be easier for solving the problem by Programming. If you do manually, then elimination approach will be easier. The penalty approach is actually it, it has been found for uh, implementing in a computer program. They have found the penalty approach. Okay, that will easily be. And the penalty approach also has one more advantage. Uh, finally, the rea finding reaction component will be easier using penalty approach. Simply minus C multiplied by Q1 will give you the reaction component one. Minus C multiplied by uh, Q2 will be give you the reaction two. Minus C multiplied by Q3 will give you the reaction number three. So that in that way it will be helpful. Okay. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, participants, uh, if you have any specific questions, you can unmute your mic and you can ask uh, Dr. Nagan, sir, to clarify the questions. Uh, one more question, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Vijayalakshmi K. Ask that. Any session on A using MATLAB? Oh, we will take care of that A and using MATLAB, so don't worry, madam. Uh, do you have a specific question? If you one dimensional problem solving, you can ask. So, audience, whether it is uh, clear, whether the step by step procedure is useful, will be able yes, to sir. follow this. Yes, sir, many participants are uh, gave their feedback. Very nice sessions. Very informative one and step by step procedure is very useful for solving problem and also it is clear sir like that uh, we are receiving the comments there so the book uh, to be followed is uh, which i have followed for this is uh, the finite elements in engineering by uh, chandru patla and balagundu okay by chandru patla and balagundu gives this type of approach okay they give they gave this approach step by step procedure and in that book they have given the program also at the end for one time down, they are given the program at C or C plus plus and all. Okay. And they have modified the same program. So even up to three dimensional problem solving, they use the same program by modifying simply the steps. So that is the main advantage of this step by, uh, procedure of analyzing uh, a P problem. Sir, one more participant, uh, Mr. Arun Kumar asked that which place use the use the topic, sir. So regarding application point of view, he is asking, sir. Oh. Where do we find the application? Okay. Ah, yes, sir. Yes. So uh, it's also a good question. Say nowadays we normally we do many lot of experiments in all our say either it is mechanical engineering or civil engineering. Okay. In civil engineering, we do norm lot of experiments on reinforcement concrete, geopolymer concrete, ferrous cement concrete, and all. Okay. Similarly, we have uh, very sensitive structures like nuclear uh, uh, radiators, okay, nuclear shield, aerospace structures, etc. Okay. So yeah, before I mean, actually implementing the practical cases, what you can do is we can simulate them using finite element model. Okay, you can simulate them using finite element model. Apply the actual loading conditions. You can simulate even the loading conditions using finite element technique. You can apply 
and then you can see where will be the failure, what will be the failure mode and all, etc. And then you can go for the prototype or the actual model of the actual case. Yeah, that will reduce a lot of, uh, uh, economically it will also it will reduce a lot of money and it will also uh, be safer, you getting safer in case of precise structures. Yeah, that is the main advantage of the point element technique. You can go for modeling the uh, problem well before the actual structure. Okay? And vice versa, you can do experimental work uh, and those experimental results can be modeled and checked, validated. Say I have done this experiment, I have got this load, I got this deflection, load deflection, and I can do the same using Pantelman model, using ANSYS or my own Pantelman coding, and I can validate my results. I get this uh, load deflection same, similar to the analytical approach, similar to the experimental approach I get here. I could find its application. And as I told, now Pantelman technique finds application in almost all the fields. Even in sports field, that is a modeling a cricket bat. So you know the configuration of a cricket bat. So that bat is being modeled using Pantelman technique. Similarly, in a musical in instrument, say you take a guitar, the guitar wire, that wire can be modeled using Pantelman technique. And as I said, in the medical field, say we have a few years before we solved the problem of modeling the artificial tooth, the artificial tooth of a human using fine element technique. We have taken that configuration, we have modeled, we applied load as fine stress strain, etc. We have suggested the uh, correct material to be used for the teeth. Okay. So those these are the applications where you can use this fine. Similarly in mechanical engineering there is wide application. In welding and all, they have we have created a, a few years before a welding model and then we have simulated the conditions and then we have suggested the appropriate welding for the purpose. So likewise it finds application almost all the fields. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, almost all, all the questions, sir. Oh, sir, one more question, sir. RM asked, sir. Is welded joint taken as a node? Uh, like that, he asked, sir. Mm, yes. We need to break the model, and that should be considered as a node. And then the temperature conditions at nodes okay, need to be applied. Then the initial temperature need to be given, and then we need to solve. Oh, okay, okay, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So almost all the questions are answered, sir. So now one more, Sunil Gavaskar asked that, uh, what is the probability to FEM solution approximated to exact? Is it possible? Like that is, is asking, sir. Hmm, okay. So that again uh, depends on the elements which you use. Okay, as I said, the final element technique, we can't say it is accurate method, exactly accurate method. It is approximate method only. However, we can get convergence by choosing the type of elements and the type of method. It, it, even if you go for ANSYS, it will ask for a refinement. Say whether we need to go for P method of refinement or H method of refinement. Thereby, thereby we can increase the number of elements to get refined results or we can re, uh, change the type of element to get the required accurate value. So thereby we can get exactly the uh, results. So that will come uh, by practice. So if I am doing a reinforced uh, cement concrete uh, problem, okay, then initially I might have used solid 65 element to model that. And finally, I may be getting error. So in order to uh, rectify the error, I'll be using some other elements to uh, get the exact value. So likewise, you can go for either element, you can choose number of elements, or you can choose the degree of element, the okay, order of approximation. Okay. Yes, thank you, sir. So almost uh, to end of the session, sir, all the questions are answered, sir. So, okay. on behalf of Amplons uh, of Technology, Department of Mechanical Engineering, so we thank you for a nice presentation for step by step procedure of one dimensional uh, problem, uh, how to formulate the uh, uh, counting equations and how to solve the problem with uh, element crystallization, element wise matrix, and also global fitness matrix, and final post processing of uh, calculation of uh, displacement and post vector. Everything is, uh, is very nicely presented, and uh, many participants have their uh, positive feedback. Uh, they have learned uh, basic problems in very deeply. So uh, thank you for your valuable time to spend with us, sir. So once again, thank you. So once again, I thank the management principal uh, of the Rampur Institute of Technology for giving me an opportunity. Similarly, the coordinators, Mr. Gerald John Brito and uh, the coordinator, what's his name? So I thank the coordinators. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. for the patient listening and uh, the questions. I wish you to learn this subject. Okay, to learn right, right now. Learn the subject with proper understanding and then apply it. Okay, that's more important. You can use this for your uh, UG projects 
as well finally uh, the PG students they can use for research as well PhD students they can use for the research in modeling that will be very useful and that's good scope for fine technique okay so thank you all uh, thank you sir thank you sir so we will send the formal letter application letter and everything oh, sir thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you, so, thank you sir. Like session? Okay. Ah, yes sir yes sir yes sir Okay, thank you, sir, Brito, sir. Ah, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay, sir. We will meet uh, afternoon session, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Any issue regarding the feedback submission? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Amudan. Thank you, Prabhar. Thank you, sir. Ah, he is busy with some other work. Uh, oh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. No problem, sir. No, okay, sir. Okay. So, participants, those who are submitted the feedback, you can leave the sessions and you can you will meet again after session three to four. So, there is a session called the uh, uh, plain stress uh, element theory and also hands on session on that uh, using the answer workbench. Okay, we will meet again on today afternoon. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir.